try this. I think that one has uh, got issues. The demon got in it. <laughs> every every church sound system is demon possessed. So you can find it in the Bible. Hezekiah 5 6. It's there. Look it up. <laughs> okay. Uh, we need to get some uh, uh, business real quick. My, my local politarian. Ken Christopherson uh, tells me we need to approve the ballot that was presented to you last Sunday that was prepared by the, um, the nominating committee, and you'll see people's uh, uh, names on there and how many were nominated for various positions. So I'll just throw it out there. If uh, you are a member of this congregation 15 years of age or older, uh, if you don't know you're a member of the congregation or not, I'd love to talk to you. Uh, but uh, if you approve that ballot signal by saying aye, any opposed? Okay, good. Business is going forward. All right, and I had um, 32 people so far give me their goals, give me give birthday presents for their goals. I, I'm, I'm happy with that. I would love to see any more, and I read through those, and I enjoy them. And um, so thank you very much for, for challenging yourself. I'm a little hot too, Lindsay. Are you just hot because, you know? Uh, but I don't know. Ken, did you check that... Uh, Thermostat back there, just make sure we're. <laughs> Turn it down on icicle. Love it. Okay, 1 Corinthians 2 2 is where we're at to start. 1 Corinthians 2 2. Uh, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I resolved that I would know nothing among except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. These are the words of Paul. Uh, I, I like the King James Version. Uh, I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Think about something you've ever been determined to do. Determined. Uh, the, the message. Um, I deliberately kept it plain and simple. First, Jesus, who He is. Then, Jesus, what He did. Jesus Christ crucified. The central core of Paul's message. It is, it is This is what he was want to do. To the court, he preached Jesus. What was true about Paul should be true about us. You know, there's a, there are a lot of churches, a lot of stuff out there talking about what uh, church is to be about. Uh, and if church is to be about anything, if our faith is to be about anything, it is to be about Jesus. Amen, right? Um. It's the heart of our message. Everything else is secondary. Who Jesus is and, and what he did. And you remember talking about goals, that one of my goals this year was to spend the year, the, the entire year, just preaching about Jesus. Not that every message I share isn't in some way somehow connected to Jesus, but this year I just felt impressed that I would, I would sincerely really try to focus on his story and, and his teaching. Um, Jesus said... When I am lifted up, but I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself, all people to myself. And of course, he was speaking about the cross, but I, I believe that there's a, a, a larger principle there. If we will make him known, if we will hold him up, if we will put him on display, the people will be drawn to him. And that's, that's, what, I, that's what I want to do, that's what we're going to do this year, 2017. Uh, and we'll, we'll see what the Lord does. Okay? So, uh, in, in that regard, we're going to spend some time here in the next few weeks is to answer your question is, is who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Who did the Heavenly Father say he was? <coughs> who did Jesus believe himself to be? And what did he tell us about himself? Those three questions are going to be really going to take us all the way up to Easter. Uh, Lent, we're just about up on the Lent season. Uh, Lent, it falls really kind of late this year, you know, the, the Lent season. That's the time when we prepare for uh, Easter, that spiritual time of prayer. Uh, comes a little late this year, later than normal. It, it all has to do with the, the phases of the moon. I, I wish they would just put it on a, you know, a nice date like Christmas or something like that so we can just make plans. But um, they've been doing that for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, so I've they won't listen to me, whoever they are. Uh, uh, we're actually planning uh, an Ash Wednesday event here, here in the sanctuary. My team of 
experts gathered in my office just Wednesday, uh, and we started talking about an Ash Wednesday service. I don't think I've ever been a part of Ash Wednesday service. I'm looking at Robbie because you know he kind of did this last year. Um, but uh, it, it's part of an old old age tradition. Some of the things we're going to be asking you to do is to participate in the old tradition of giving something up for Lent. You've heard that phrase before. I gave this up for Lent. I gave this up for Lent. Uh, so uh, think about something that you could do, maybe, in the way of spiritual preparation, thinking about, praying about Easter coming, you know, what I might sacrifice or do during that Lent season. And I'll be participating with that. Also, we're going to be each Sunday evening during the Lent season, uh, having prayer time, walking around the church. We did this a couple of years ago, just in anticipation of Easter. You, know, you, you have relatives, you have friends, that it's Christmas and Easter. Uh, and Christmas, depending upon how it falls in the week, Easter, uh, they'll come on Easter Sunday. I would think it would be good for us to spiritually prepare ourselves and pray about that day, especially that day, and, and people coming. And I hope you, I think you should make plans to participate in the Ash Wednesday service and in the prayer time and so forth. So, okay, uh, let's begin this, this whole thing uh, uh, about Jesus by, by looking at the beginning of his ministry. What some people have characterized as his uh, inauguration, you could say. We just went through an inauguration. And uh, you who have been around long enough could reflect upon the various inaugurations of various presidents. Presidents give up and give their inauguration <coughs> speech, and they, they try to set a tone for their administration. Uh, they try to give us a picture of what they could uh, what they could expect. And the baptism, Jesus, the, excuse me, the baptism of Jesus Christ could be looked upon as sort of an inauguration. Uh, here we get a sense of the tone of his ministry. Here we get a sense of, of what we could expect. When I look at those passages, I, I kind of want to ask the question, uh, you know, why did Jesus have to be baptized? And uh, why is that important to me that he was? I mean, I can see the wheels turning in your head. I can see it. Some it's a little easier than others, but I can see the wheels. Uh, I have an occasion. Occasionally, I conduct a, a baptism class, and I like to talk about baptism as sort of a play to be uh, performed by the candidates who are being baptized. They are acting out a life story in front of people. And the, the baptism... Uh, ceremony, uh, sacrament is, is a beautiful symbolism of, of something that's happened to me when I became a Christian. Uh, I was dirty in my sins. I needed, uh, I was dirty in my sins. I, I needed a bath. I, needed to clean. I was dirty. I needed be a bath made clean. I, I needed to, to die to my selfishness. And I described well, every time I have a class, how they, they go out to sea, sailors sometimes are buried at sea. You know, we, we bury them. We are buried in a watery grave in the baptism. And I needed to die to my selfishness. And, and I have been given, but I'm not left there. I'm given a, a new life, a resurrection to a new life. And then when I come out, I always ask the kids, when you come out of the bathtub, what are you covered with? You know, they kind of look at me. I'm covered in water, but I, the symbolism there is I'm covered in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, of Christ. And I can go into the scriptures and list all those and support those, but you know we don't have time for that. But that's essentially the symbolism that's wrapped up in that act. You're acting out a story. You're acting out a play. Uh, and it, I would also throw out there, if, if you've never been baptized, if you would like to be baptized, come and talk to me about it. Um, this is a, a beautiful ceremony. It's, it's a testimony to those people who are watching on. I was dirty and I needed a bath. And I'm telling the whole world that. That God gave me a new life. <coughs> but where on that list of stuff does that apply to Jesus? 
You know, he didn't need a bat. He didn't need to die to selfishness. He was the resurrected in life. He himself was righteousness. He was not dirty in his sins. The scripture tells us that. And I, I, I touched on this a couple of weeks ago. He committed, he committed no what? And no deceit was found in his mouth. He committed no And it's, it's really, really, really important that you understand that. It's really, really important that you believe that. As I said a couple of weeks ago, if Jesus sinned, then all bets are off. His, his death has no meaning to me and to you. So why? Why was this important? Why was this event in his life important? Well, then I'll, uh, tell him. I'll, I'll, let, uh, I'll, I'll let the passage speak for itself, okay? So Matthew chapter 3, verse 7 is where I'm picking up, starting off off. And there, I, I could have jumped in there about anywhere, but I, I backed up a little bit. Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. But when he saw many Pharisees, and we're talking about John the baptizer here. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think... You came to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, uh, God can raise up the children of Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. John was not one of those kind of feel-good kind of preachers. Verse 11. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come... One who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. I love that. His winning fork is in his hand. He will clear his threshing floor, gathering his weed in the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then, Jesus came to Galilee, to the Jordan, to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I, I need to be baptized by you. Do you come to me? And Jesus replied, Let it now, let it so now, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven saying, This is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. Amen. Chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And that, that passage goes on. And I, I think we'll be spending time in that episode next week some more. You know, the gospel writers understood that this was a very critical moment. In the ministry of Jesus Christ. So, so important that, that all four of the gospel writers write about it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Mark and John really skip over the whole birth narrative. John has his own version of it. But really, in essence, they skip over the birth narratives. And they go right to the ministry of John the Baptist. And, and the baptism of Jesus Christ. They all make careful record of the event. And they each have their own little take on it. You could do a study this week on, on the variations of, between the, the events. But in Matthew's record of the event, we have Jesus giving us very specific reasons as why he needed to be baptized. Verse 13, back to 13. Then he came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized. And John tried to injure him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me. Um... So why was it important for Jesus to be baptized? Jesus replied, let it now so let, I don't know, I have trouble with that particular line. Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to what? Fulfill, to fulfill all what? Then John consented to fill, fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. All righteousness, righteousness, you know, that's not a word we kind of throw around a lot. 
we use a lot. Um, really, righteousness simply means rightness. When things are right, they are righteous. If you go to a church potluck and they have fried chicken, that's right. Amen. That's a righteous potluck in my interpretation. Would you agree? Amen. Vegetarians out there. <laughs> Righteous. And Jesus is saying that this baptism has to be done so that things can be set right. You know, I can appreciate the fact that this is the inauguration of the ministry of Jesus Christ. And to me, it's like Jesus is saying, this has to be done because my ministry has to be set off on the right foot. Now, I don't know if that zings you or not, but apparently it was a very important event in the life of Jesus Christ. It has to be done to fulfill all righteousness. Sounds kind of important, wouldn't you say? Um, but but then, then what happens next? Uh, as soon as Jesus was baptized, went out of the water, and at that moment the heavens opened up, I don't know what that looks like, what the heavens opening up looks like, I kind of get the picture in my head, you know, a bunch of Oklahoma thunderclouds parting, you know, and the sun shining through and, and, and landing on the scene. Uh, I, I don't know if that's your picture. You draw your own picture. And then the Spirit of God descended like a dove, lighting on him. There's debate about whether or not everyone in the crowd saw this. The Holy Spirit descending like a dove in the form of a dove. Or if this is something that just Jesus, John's gospel records that, that John, the baptizer, saw it. And then a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With, I am, with him I am well pleased. A voice from heaven. Three times in the Bible we have that happening. Once here and on the Mount of Transfiguration, and, and then there was this other time when Jesus is uh, just finished with his triumphal entry, and he's pondering the cross ahead of him, and I won't read it, but you look it up, John chapter 12, verse 27, you look it up, and there's God speaks to Jesus in an audible voice. And some people hear it and say, oh, sounds like thunder. Now, now, regarding that moment when God spoke to Jesus at his baptism, we aren't, again, we aren't given any clue as to whether or not anybody else heard the voice or if Jesus was the only one to privy to it. But if you and I had been there, and if you and I had been the well-schooled Jewish people that would have been standing around in that day, because the Jewish people were well-schooled, especially in the scriptures, and if we had heard it, and not mistaken it for thunder or something like that, we would have likely recognized something in those words. This is my son, and whom I am well pleased, I'm well pleased. In fact, there, there very likely would have been two passages that would have come to mind. One is Psalms chapter 2, verse 7. I proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. That might have been ringing an air of familiarity with you. You good Jewish school scholars. Another, and I think more importantly, would have come from the book of Isaiah, from sections there that we describe as passages referring to the suffering servant. If you've done any Bible study, you know, around in Isaiah, you've talked perhaps about the, the suffering servant. Isaiah 42, verse 1, here is my servant, whom I have told, my chosen one whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. Uh, again, if you and I were the, the well-educated Jewish people standing around that day, and we had heard the voice of God, there would have been a good chance that your mind would have gone back to that one particular passage in Isaiah. And it would have been like, huh, did, you know, did I hear God speak? Huh. You know, those words... Kind of sound familiar. Huh. Uh, Jewish people said, huh, a lot. <laughs> Aren't those words from my 
Isaiah? Is the Father telling us something about this man? This man, Jesus? Is Jesus the suffering servant that the prophet Isaiah spoke about? And you're sitting there and I can see your wheels turning again in your head. You're like, suffering servant, suffering servant, suffering servant. What, you know, what, what's, the, what's the big deal? Well, here, when God was speaking through the prophet so many years ago, uh, before Jesus' incarnation, he wanted his people, the nation of Israel, to understand what was going to be the nature, the tenor of the Messiah's coming. So under the, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we have these several passages in Isaiah which give us the, a character study. And this, this mysterious person, for those people back then, this suffering servant, and this, this imagery was, was given to the Jews, and we, we learn a lot about what this person was supposed to be like. The suffering servant was someone who was going to be, was going to be uh, humble. Humble. He was going to be rejected. He was going to be made to suffer and die. But also to, to come forth in, in victory. Come forth in victory. Yeah. Now, now the Jewish people, many of them weren't expecting that out of their Messiah. And yet God is telling them, this is what this guy, this, this coming Messiah, this is the character, the nature of his ministry. His life is going to be like. You know, in, in theological uh, uh, debates, there are some questions that various scholars like to throw around. Um, and, and really, these questions really don't have an answer. But they like to debate them anyway. Um, in, in, in medieval times, there were certain questions they would like to debate. And one of those was, uh, and I was just talking about this on Facebook with the Morris family, uh, how many angels can sit on the head of a pen? Yeah. It was related to, who was it, uh, Asher's question when he said, if I cough or sneeze, what happens if I, Jesus comes out, God comes out. You know? So that, to me, is an unanswerable question. I can't answer that question for Asher. He's, he's just taking his chance, I think, every time he's. But I did look it up on, uh, on uh, Google Images, and I found out that's about how many angels can sit on the head of a pen. I said, okay. Well, Cornelia, it does depend upon what kind of pen you're talking about. Because there was another kind of pen, and apparently just one angel could sit upon a, a bowling pen. Just so you know. Um, but one of the unanswerable questions is, is, is when did Jesus come to know exactly who he was? You know, when did Jesus come to know who he was? I mean, does anyone believe that while Jesus was laying in the manger, he is saying to himself, goo goo, ga ga, I have come to save the world? <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'm stretching myself here, but I don't think so. So when did Jesus know who he was? That's a question people like to debate. Now, when people ask me that question, I like to throw back at them, when did you know? You were who you were. When did you realize that? Think of that. When did Rick Green know that he was Rick Green? I don't quite remember the moment when it happened. I think it was something like I'm laying in the crib thinking, I think, therefore I am. <laughs> I'm a descendant of Rene Descartes. So. When did Jesus know who he was? When did you know who you were? Yes, pastor, I hear the wheels turning again. <laughs> but he was only God's only begotten son. That's different. That's different. Exactly. That's different. He was different. He was the same, and yet he was different. And some people, many, many smart people, will say that it was at his baptism was when he realized that he was who he was. And I'm not as smart as a lot of people. 
You know, but they'll say that it wasn't until he came up out of the water and the Holy Spirit landed up, was sent upon him, then he knew he was the Messiah. And I will tell you, I, I don't see it that way. You know? Again, we're talking about the unanswerable question, though. But certainly there were factors in play here. Certainly his parents would have told him the story. <clears throat> certainly Mary would have sat down and said, there was a, a, a miraculous conception. There was a miraculous birth. There were angels. There were shepherds. There were wise men. There were gifts. There was a star in the sky, for heaven's sake. There were dreams. Certainly the parents would have told them. And then we have that whole episode in the temple where Jesus is 12 years old. You know it so well, don't you? They go to Jerusalem from Nazareth. They go to the Passover. They take Jesus along. They are in a company of friends and relatives, and they leave Jerusalem. They're a day traveling. And somebody looks around, have you seen Jesus? No. Do you have Jesus? No, I didn't have him. So they got to travel a day back, and they're looking all over Jerusalem. Can you imagine panic? Dear God, we've lost your son. No. And then they find him in the temple. What does Jesus say to them? Didn't you know? You know, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? A hint. At a very early age, Jesus knew what he was about. And then, and then figure the fact that he, he was, not only was fully God, but fully man. So we would expect his, his thinking, his life, his reasoning to be extraordinary. He was divine. So what's your point, preacher? What are you trying to say? What, I, what I'm trying to say is, I, I imagine that day, Jesus living in Nazareth. He's working in the carpentry <clears throat> shop that, that his father, who we think now is deceased, would have left him with all the tools. And he hears about his cousin, John the Baptizer, out in, way off in the wilderness by the Jordan River, <coughs> baptizing people, baptizing people. And something stirs in him in that moment. And he knows it's time. It's time to put down the tools. Time to hang up the carpenter's apron. Time to walk out of that shop, away from that little community that he grew up in. And it's time to begin. And what is the very first thing that he does? Knowing who he is. He heads straight out into the wilderness, towards the Jordan, to see John, who is preaching and baptizing repentant people. And Jesus is, you know, imagine the, the scene. Jesus is standing in line, waiting to be baptized. Can you imagine that? And there he is, and John looks up and he recognizes him. I want to be one of those people that recognizes Jesus. Don't you? And he sees him. And he's baptized. To fulfill righteousness, to make it right. And he's there to set the tone of his ministry. It is his inauguration event. I'm here. I'm here standing among you. I'm not, not living over you, but I'm humbly walking with you. And I'm here to suffer for you because this baptism is symbolic of the death I'm going to receive. So John, cousin John, Baptize me. Baptize me so that all things can be set right from the very beginning. I am here to humble myself and to die. I am here to set the resurrection. I'm here to provide victory for all of you. When it came time to begin his ministry, Jesus willingly accepted the task in accordance with everything that it was meant to be, to make it right. From the beginning. And again, I don't know if that zings you or not. And really, I, Marilyn will tell you, I struggled with this message. And just ask her specifically to pray for me about it. But if there's anything that this message is about, is to appreciate. Appreciate what Jesus was about. And appreciate who he was, who he is. And appreciate what he came to do from the beginning. One of the interesting things that is related to all this is that, that it, it, 
it was everything that that baptism represented, that baptism represented, that afterwards, immediately afterwards, Satan began to tempt Jesus not to believe or do. God says, this is my son, you know, in whom I am well pleased. This is my son, whom I am well pleased. And then right after that, we hear Satan's voice in Jesus' ear. You know, the tempter saying to him, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. <coughs> and really, in some ways, it's one of those unanswerable questions. But to me, it's not a temptation if Jesus didn't have the opportunity to fall. But there was no worry in it. Still, the temptation was there to doubt the words of the Heavenly Father. Right away. And then the whole baptism is a symbolism of his death. And what does Satan try to tempt him to do? I don't know if you can read those words, but then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from where it is written. He will command his angels concerning you. They will lift you up in your hands and so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. To do the very thing. To do, do an act. To be saved. To have life. To not die. Jesus came to walk humbly. And then Satan was tempting him about that. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain. And showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Their splendor. All this... I give you, he says, I will give you, he says, if you will bow down and worship me. Essentially, everything that the baptism event represented, Satan tried to negate. You see that? It, the, the two events are inseparable. The baptism and the temptation. They go hand in hand. But Jesus would not he could not, he would not, he could not. Why? Simply for your sake. Because he loved you. He was determined. John 9, 51. As time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus, what's that next word? Resolutely set out for Jerusalem. So people, this, this is what this, this baptism of Jesus represents to me, represents for us. This is what the moment means for all of us. This is, this is why it bears such great importance. This is who Jesus is, God's only begotten Son who came to die so that you and I might have life. He did it to fulfill righteousness. Amen? Amen. And again... What is this message about? Simply, I really think it's, it's just about appreciating who Jesus is and, and what he came to do. And as we approach a Lenten season, I think that that would be appropriate for us in our prayer times, in our reflections, to appreciate that at the very beginning of his ministry, even at that moment, that very first moment, Jesus came to die for you. Let us pray. Would you take a moment in the prayer closet of your mind to go in there and have a conversation with Jesus? With the gift of the Holy Spirit, you're able to do that. What would you say to him? What do you want to say to him? Words of appreciation, gratitude, reflection. Would you just have that conversation now? in your heart are the words of Jesus to you right now. Would you stop, maybe the first time this week, stop and listen to his voice right now? Jesus, we are so appreciative of, of 
of what you came to do. Your ministry was wrapped up in the task of coming, living, and dying for us to be our suffering servant. Lord, the voice from heaven, your <coughs> heavenly Father, our God, you are his son, his only begotten son, and who he is well pleased. Lord, we believe that, we accept that. And we accept your death as our salvation. And we stand here, grateful people, humble people, grateful people, grateful people. Thank you. Now, as we go this week, Lord, help us to reflect the life that you live for us, so that we too may die and live for you. Jesus, in your precious name, and together we say, Amen. <coughs> amen. God is good, amen? Amen. amen. I love you all. You're dismissed. Bye-bye.